Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. joke between me and my husband at how much I generally don't step out of line. Like I'm a total role player. If, you know, if TSA says 3.4 ounces can come through and minus 3.5 ounces, I'm not bringing it. <laughs> I don't generally step out of line. I guess the the moment I did, really when I realized, you know, I love the beauty industry and I've been in it for over 25 years. And, you know, I started as a makeup artist and then I moved into education when I realized that there were a lot of people who wanted to play in the space that didn't feel they had the ability or the skill set. And I was like, oh, I'll get into education because I'm a pro. And who better than me to teach you? And then my own life shifted and my own perspective shifted. And I realized why I'm in this industry didn't line up with how this industry traditionally does things. And so I think for me, it was, I now see things differently. I want to change that. And so I think that that for me was probably the, the first time ever in my life that I said, no, no, I'm going against the grain here. We got to we got to make a change. I could tell us first a little bit about your business. How did you come up with the idea and how are you moving forward with it? Because I know you're a pretty new company. It didn't set out when people say, did you always know you want to start your own company? And the answer is no, absolutely not. I didn't think it was going to be my path, but I guess you never know what life is going to present you with. I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a makeup artist, that uh, for whatever reason, I was good at it. And it was a very safe space for me. I played in that space a lot. My community as a very awkward kid, I didn't know how to connect with people. But I found that when somebody sat in my makeup chair, I could connect. That, that was a safe space. And so, uh, and, and over and over again, people would say to me, you know, I wish I could do this for myself. I can't do this. And I kept thinking, well, I'll show you. I'm, I'm good at this. I think when you have such a positive experience with something, you want to pass it on. So for most of my career, I kind of ran parallel paths. I was working as a makeup artist on set, and I was working developing education programs for companies like Smashbox and Temp2 and Josie Marin, and it was all going swimmingly, and I loved it. I will say I was always aware that hopefully I was doing somewhat of a good job in education, but there was still always a disconnect. I wasn't able to help everybody with the tools I had in front of me. At that point, I didn't totally have a full perspective of, of uh, what was needed. Somewhere around, I guess it's about 12 years ago now, maybe longer, I started to find that there was a shift in my ability. I mean, that there's probably other memories, but I have a very distinct memory of being on set. It was with a model I knew. It was a crew I knew. The look for me at the time was super easy. It was fresh, clean, pretty. I should have been able to knock out that look in like 20 minutes. 20 minute pass, 30 minutes pass, 40 minutes, we're like, we're nearing an hour. And I, I couldn't, I, I don't even know if I knew how to explain it at the time. I just kept thinking, what is this disconnect? As a makeup artist, I could always look at you and sort of imagine how I wanted to celebrate your features. And my arm and my hand were just this very direct extension of my mind's eye. And it could just happen. Like my arm and my hand were the tool. And I, I there was just this disconnect. It wasn't happening. I mean, somehow I powered through the day, thought it was really odd, kind of ignored it. Those moments kept happening to me. I started going to doctors because whatever that disconnect was started to, to grow, <laughs> started to progress. I started to lose the ability to independently move my fingers from one another. My arms started to lock up. It was incredibly painful. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And doctors were saying things like, well, you're getting older. You should drink more water. Take some vitamins. Are you drinking? Don't have any alcohol. Like <laughs> all those things. And in some sense, I was like, well, that makes no sense. And then on the other side, I was like, well, that sounds better than hearing something terrible, so I'll go with that. But as time went on and those as those symptoms continued to progress, I, I think I hit a point where I was like, this is insane. You know, it's five years of what's going on with me and getting nowhere. It, this can't, there's got to be an answer. Eventually, I got in front of the right person. I got in front of the right neurologist who very quickly diagnosed me with Parkinson's. And... I was presenting in my left side, and I was always a left-handed makeup artist. And so once I found that out, it was interesting because obviously, you know, nobody wants to get news like that. You have a chronic progressive disease. 
at the same time, I spent so many years sort of thinking, I'm nuts, There's, uh, nobody's believing me, there's something wrong, I don't know what it is. It sort of leaves you in limbo, you don't know how to move forward. So there was something very empowering that day. At least I know what I'm dealing with, maybe I can solve for it. And that day, I actually ran home and pulled out my makeup kit, I pulled out my husband's toolkit, and I thought to myself, all right, I know the mechanics of good artistry. Now I know what I'm dealing with. Maybe I can create my own tools and keep myself in the game. And as I was working on these prototypes, at one point I, I hit on something. It kind of looked like a finger puppet with a little mascara ball on it. And I would put it up to my finger or to my eye and I would start to link into it. I turned to my husband and I said, wow, this is easy. This is really easy for me right now. Actually, this would have been easy for the thousands of people who sat in my chair and said, I wish I could do makeup. I wish I had the ability. I wish I could do it like you did. And that was the shift. That was kind of that aha moment where I realized this was now bigger than me. And for, you know, decades, I was trying to solve for an issue I couldn't solve for because I only understood one side of it. I only knew what it felt like to be a professional makeup artist. Now I was understanding the disconnect. And I was realizing that we are so limited in the way we're designing our products. And I thought, well, what if I take a step back and start to shift our perspective? I'm in this sort of white space. I know both sides. Maybe I can change things for me and for anybody else who ever said, I wish I could do this. I'd love to play in the space, but I've never been invited before. Or I'm here, the door's open for me, but I'm just not that good at it for whatever reason. And I started on this path. Uh, it led me to some really interesting things and meeting great engineers and a whole interesting universal design process. That's kind of how I landed this space. I think once you see something that you're, especially because I was so passionate about it, once I saw what could be done, you can't unsee it, right? That's how I got started, at least. Selma Blair obviously is a big part of your company and what you do. I'm also looking at women who are coming out, like Christina Applegate, who are coming out with, let's find a solution how to deal with my symptoms, and I need shoes that work, I need this that works. You know, I'm thinking everybody is really more open about it and more transparent about what is needed and they're not afraid to ask for it and sometimes it takes somebody who is a public figure to ask for it and then all of a sudden things start to come together so when Selmer Blair became an advocate or a spokesperson for your company when did things shift did it did it become like more universal for people to say okay let's go let's do this was it easier for you from that standpoint yeah I mean certainly having her voice and you know she was very open, very authentic, uh, and very passionate uh, in this space. She wants to change the narrative. She wants to bring awareness. Um, also, just because of the way we do things at this brand, having another partner, strong partner, who has a different perspective, because that's how we do things, right? Like, I think when I look at the industry and I think about, and I was part of the problem for many years, I think about how products are developed. It's really, if you think about it, it's a product development team, and they bring in people like me. It's a group of makeup artists, you're the pros, you create it. But now you're only really creating products for one person, right? Like how less inclusive can we be? I think our process, which is universal design, is inviting everybody into the room. You want to cast the widest net possible. So if you have MS, if you have Parkinson's, arthritis, if you are a professional makeup artist, if you're a newbie, whatever it is, come in and let's watch everybody play. And you're going to find the similarities. You're going to find common human factors we all need, maybe at different levels, build those factors into the tools. Because I like to say, I appreciate adaption. I do. And at times I'm going to need it, but I don't want that to be the first stop on the train. First, look for inclusion. First, try to develop inclusively. And then if it doesn't work, then try to help me with something adaptive, right? And I think that's the principles behind universal design. Thelma is just this tremendous voice and her experience and how she holds the tools and how she works with our products when we're in the, in the lab together is different than mine. Her symptoms progress differently, which is also, you know, she has MS, my husband has MS. Their symptoms present very differently. We're all unique, but certainly her voice has really opened the door for a lot of people to say, we belong here and we, we feel seen. I have things where my hand and it don't work. Yeah, I know. Oh, and this guy, I can't use this kind of it out. I have this guy. This guy has this way. I can't do it. There is a brand that was not made for people with disabilities, but they have a higher art to it that helped me use it. 
And actually, and I have a lot of benefit products for the same reason. They have a lot of panels. They have a lot of whips sort of built into their tools, uh, which make them easier to hold. Even if they didn't realize that's why they were doing it, there was probably some level of awareness that they realized was going to help on a greater level, which is kind of brilliant in itself because that's kind of a moment to prove what happens when you actually are thoughtful of those moments, right? Like it makes her feel put together, obviously. Yeah. And we just celebrate ourselves, right? Something I've always been able to do for myself. So I, I you know, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't born with, you know, well, well, maybe I was born with Parkinson's, but my <laughs> symptoms didn't progress till later in life. So this was something I was always able to do. And then all of a sudden I find myself excluded from a space I always felt like I belonged. And I always was able to own walking out of the world and be able to celebrate myself and make up the way I wanted to. So when I struggle now to open the compact, and even to, to your point, Mary, is that, you know, you, you think about these, these compacts that we open, and obviously no one design is perfect for everybody, but we can continue to work towards better, right? There's, and I think what people miss is, and going back to the idea of doing the right thing is also the profitable thing, because let's think that we'd like to think that everybody's going to do something because it's the right thing to do. But business is business, and so sometimes you have to show people that it's also the profitable thing to do, right? The, the right thing is also a business decision, but it's also better design. So when you're having trouble holding a compact or uh, the things that you're, those, those are all human factors, grip, stability. And we all need them. So prior to my hand shaking, let's say I'm on set and I've just put moisturizer on and there's a compact that has no thought to it in terms of grip and stability. My hands are a little slippery, slides right out. Or I have now I have trouble working into that moment and opening up that little clip. Something that may be the only way I can play with makeup now, then would have been, I may have already been able to play in that space, would have made it easier for me then. It's sort of um it's like the story of the remote control for the TV, right? The remote control for the TV was originally created for people who had trouble crossing a room and turning a TV off and on, right? Meanwhile, fast forward decades ahead, and we all expect a remote control with our TV. I may not need the remote control, but I'm certainly enjoying that I don't have to cross the room, right? So that the thing that it's just this idea of that we should be thinking inclusively. We should be inviting everybody to the room because on some level, it will help you. So if you factor in for those who have the greatest challenge, make sure they're invited to the party. Those right. who are already at that party are going to enjoy it. And I promise you that. It will make a better product and process and community for all of us. And I think that's what we're identifying. And I think that's sort of the shift in narrative that I'd love for our industry to start seeing. So that when somebody says that you say, I have a hard time opening or holding or it shouldn't be, well, oh, you can't because you are disabled. It, first, the first thought should be, is this product disabling? And how much can I remove that from the tool? Where is the disconnect between the user and the tool? Can I solve for that first? Because I don't always want to own it, right? Sometimes in life, it is because I have Parkinson's. Sometimes it's because you didn't think well enough and you weren't thoughtful enough in the tool that you were creating. I have like a beginning line. What are you planning on? putting out in the future? I want to keep going. I mean, certainly we started with universal design is always going to be a work in progress. I mean, it is a process where you actually, you know, if you go back to, to the way products are normally created, it's very often custom forms that brands take off a shelf and then deco them, uh, put your fill in and it's out the door and it's an easier process. We custom tool, we redesign every tool we have. So it's a longer process, but we do it by inviting people into the room from you know, from all skill sets and abilities and disabilities we, to help us with that process. So it takes some time, but um, I'm hoping our forms eventually become the new forms. Uh, you know, we started with the eye area because those are sort of traditionally the hardest to do. Things like eyeliner or mascara or brow that you know, require greater fine motor skills and precision and application. Uh, we started there. Uh, we want to continue to improve on them because I think there's always going to be a work in progress when you're working in universal design. And so that was the eye area. But we want to build out a whole face and beyond. So we're still in the lab working with as many people as possible. And interestingly enough, more people are open to now working with us. We're in the beginning, I think, because the industry is sort of set up in a way to make people feel like if you don't pick something, can't pick something up immediately and do it perfectly, there's something wrong with you. So we have a lot of people who weren't very comfortable showing us when we first started that they couldn't do makeup. We had to sort of break down those barriers. 
I think as we've gone, people are really excited and open to say, well, let me show you where I'm having challenges. Because when you see the challenge, that's the moment of gold. If I can see what's happening, if I can see where the challenge hits, then I can solve for it. And so I want to do that with eyes. I want to do that with foundation. I want to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the face as a makeup artist, but, you know, the, the beauty world is big and we have a lot more body areas. I certainly have a lot of ideas of where we can go, but uh, I think, it, you know, as a, as a makeup brand, we're going to start by giving everybody the opportunity to have a full guide beauty face. When you got diagnosed, most people would be very angry and just pull up somewhere and deal with it that way. And you went home and started doing something. So besides your own inner strength, who else said, let's do this, we can do it? When I talk about my story, and it is my way, I do get sort of tunnel vision. And uh, if you give me a small, small challenge, I might, I might panic a little bit. But when big things have come my way in my life, I kind of look to, to sort of tunnel vision to solve for them. But that doesn't mean that I didn't have moments where I crawled under the table and cried and, you know, curled up and thought, I can't do this. I am very fortunate to have a, a great support network around me. My, you know, my family is amazing. My husband. I've also been in this industry a long time. And one of the reasons I love, I've always loved this, is it's not just been my livelihood, but it's my community. My greatest friendships have been made in this in this world. And so I have a lot of friends for 25 years being in this space who understand product development, marketing, sales, and they rallied around and said, if this is what you want to do, we got your back, right? And then, you know, I also found you know, for years, for several years when I, I, I kept it a secret that I had Parkinson's, I was afraid to let people know what was going on because I thought I'm not going to have a job anymore. Uh, you know, and I, so I got to hide this. The moment I opened up, I found that there was also a whole community of people who, you know, were there and people were willing to share their stories. And it was, didn't just have to be Parkinson's. It was, it was MS. It was arthritis. It was, it was a world of moments where people were, were sharing with me. And I just, the more people that I, you know, I opened up to, the more people opened up back. I just, I just had a support level that I knew was there. And there's also this, this point of, you know, I could not do it. There was, I, I, it's like there was such a strong aha moment. It was so clear to me that it was it's such a simple sort of, and not, it's not necessarily a simple process to rethink how we're creating products, but it's a simple shift in thinking and how we can recreate products. So I just couldn't not do it, but I don't, I certainly don't think without that support group around me, I would have been able to, to move forward the way I did. When times are tough and things aren't going well, as they inevitably is not, it's not if, it's when, um, you know, that's one thing I could sort of can always sort of lean in on, which is, I know, I know I will regret not trying. I know, and and if I if I'm going to look in the mirror and I know that I'm going to regret not trying, that's it. Then I then what else can I do? I have no other option because I don't want to sit forever and and wonder what if. You know, I can think through the worst case scenario of, of what happens if I did this and it, and it didn't work. You know, it's always easier said, you know, before it happens. Well, I can deal. I can deal. It's still hard when it happens. But if you know the why behind what you're doing and and you really understand that that and that's the driving force that that keeps you going. So I completely connect with that. I know it's exciting to me that to, to realize that there's more of us. And that we are we are making our voices heard because, you know, we're not alone. This is everybody. I'm really trying to close that door. There's so much of creating for us and them. And that this is a we moment. Disability is uh, the one quote unquote minority we will all find ourselves in, whether temporarily or long term. But it has, it's part of life. That shift of narrative sounds like you know, part of where you're heading. I, I think doing this is how we change. We change the game.